everyone. All right, we're going to try and get started. Of course, now Dr. Levy gets you after you're on your high from lunch or crash, I'm not sure which. Okay, so next up is Dr. Levy, who also a lot of you know. He's one of many of your doctors. And he is, of course, part of our Transverse Myelitis Center and opened the NMO clinic within the umbrella of the TM Center in 2009. And he's going to be talking to you about stem cell therapy, where we stand with it uh, at this point in time. Dr. Levy. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So I started here in uh, 2004 as a resident, and I made my way to Doug Kerr's lab in 2006, working on transverse myelitis particularly trying to find a stem cell regenerative therapy treatment option for patients with TM. And so while I've differentiated clinically into NMO, um, half of my lab focus is still on finding a stem cell treatment for TM, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. And this applies not just to the idiopathic TM, but to transverse myelitis of all causes, NMO, <clears throat> and maybe even vascular. So here's the outline of, the, of, of our brief talk today, 15 minutes. I'm going to discuss why TM is an ideal proof of concept model for stem cell transplants, the type of stem cells we use, how those stem cells work, the animal studies that we've been doing to get this moving into a human study, what a TM trial might look like and beyond. So the nice thing about TM is that there's just one lesion. For those who've had uh, multiple lesions, this doesn't apply to you, but for a lot of TM patients, there's just one lesion. And that's the only lesion you need to overcome. So for a stem cell transplant, this is kind of ideal, because if we could just target one lesion, see what the stem cells could do for that one lesion, we'd get a better sense of how those stem cells work. A lot of TM patients are otherwise pretty healthy. Um, they may even be immunologically normal, so they had sort of one accident. The immune system made one mistake, apologized, and then from then on has a normal immune system, and that's pretty typical. So that's uh, in your favor for something like a stem cell trial where you're going to be introducing a foreign substance. You want the immune system to be predictable. And for a lot of TM patients, by the time... Uh, you know, two years comes along, Dr. Becker was saying, don't ever let anyone tell you you're not going to continue to get better. That's very true, but a lot of people sort of stabilize after a period of time. And so that's good for a trial, because if we intervene and we see a change, we want to know that prior to the intervention, there was a stable baseline. So that's, those are all the good reasons why TM is a good model for a stem cell transplant. But here are the challenges. We, we cannot cause more harm. And you may say, well, I'm already in a wheelchair, how much more harm can you cause? But there, are, there is a lot more harm that can be caused. A tumor can grow, can affect your arms. We may cause other kinds of damage. So we don't want to just throw some stem cells in. I get patients coming into the clinic all the time. They may roll in in their wheelchair, roll up their sleeves and say, just inject the stem cells in there. It's not that simple. We really don't want to cause a lot more harm. We do have to access the lesion. You've seen pictures of MRIs now where the spinal cord is very well protected by bones, um, and those bones have to be removed for stem cell injection, but that's doable now, and I'll show you a picture of that. Once the stem cells are in there, you have a healthy immune system. Otherwise, we want to prevent the healthy immune system from removing those foreign stem cells. So that's a little bit of a challenge. Once the stem cells are in there and they're not being attacked by your immune system, we want them to do the right thing. We want them to go to the lesion, we want them to find the area that's either demyelinated or damaged, and we want it to regenerate that area. And then ultimately, we want it to improve your function. And this, is, this sounds uh, um, like pretty obvious, but it's not, because um, in animal models, we can get stem cells to move to areas. We can even get them to form myelin. But what we need to really show is that it results ultimately in improvement either in walking or vision or whatever we're targeting. This is what I'm not 
talking about. What I'm not talking about is stuff you'll read mostly in newspapers, which is when they, when they discuss things like stem cell transplants, especially in MS, what they're mostly talking about is harvesting your own stem cells from your bone marrow. This, this process involves a type of stem cell called a mesenchymal stem cell. Once you take out all the other blood cells from the bone marrow, all you're left with are these cells called mesenchymal cells. And they have the ability to regenerate to many different types of tissues, like bone, fat, and cartilage. So they, they are stem cells in the sense that they are uh, immature in development and can form uh, different tissue types, but they don't result in regeneration of nervous system tissue. And most of the time, these stem cell trials are designed to help MS victims replace or modulate their immune system. And so for TM patients with just one attack that are otherwise immunologically normal, harvesting bone marrow stem cells has no purpose. You don't want mesenchymal stem cells. You, you want stem cells that are going to regenerate nervous system tissue. So what are those types of stem cells? Well, ultimately, you want to make neurons. These are the cells that actually fire electrical signals that help you move and think. Astrocytes are supportive cells. They feed the brain. Uh, they maintain um, electrical homeostasis. And then oligodendrocytes are the cells that make myelin, the um, insulating sheaths. If we could, we would just take these mature cells from the dish in my lab and just transplant them into your spinal cord, but it doesn't work that way. Mature cells are very fragile. They don't incorporate into a new environment well. Um, once they become cells that look like this, uh, if you basically, if you even just move them, they'll, they'll die off or they'll, they'll break down. So what we use instead are the stem cells that would eventually become these cells. Stem cells can be harvested in the dish. You can move them around from place to place. You can split them. They divide uh, quickly. They can multiply. Um, they can migrate, so you don't have to get the lead. You don't have to get exactly into the right uh, place in the spinal cord. You can kind of inject somewhere close by, and these stem cells can migrate. These cells do not migrate. So that's the advantage of using a stem cell. But ultimately, these stem cells have to then, what we call differentiate, or in other words, they have to grow into their final tissue uh, type. There are many different companies that make stem cells. The first one that uh, launched a trial in um, spinal cord injury was Geron back in 2010. They enrolled five or six patients with um, acute spinal cord injury and they transplanted them. And all five of them were not harmed. And that was really the point of the study. So proven to be safe. And they used embryonic stem cells. So these are embryonic uh, cells that are very, very early in life. They can form basically any tissue type. And in their patented process, in 42 days, they could take an embryonic stem cell into a cell that looked that would eventually make an oligodendrocyte. Geron, unfortunately, dropped their stem cell program during the recession. Uh, their, uh, their stock price suffered, and they just couldn't maintain the, the program. Stem Cells, Inc. in California, across the bridge from Facebook, has a program in spinal cord injury as well. And they're launching a phase two study in um, Canada and in Zurich, Switzerland. Neurostem is a company we work with because they're local. They're in Rockville, Maryland. They've been targeting ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, and they produce, uh, they manufacture neural stem cells that we think may be useful in TM, and so we've partnered with them. Q Therapeutics um, in Utah was a cell that uh, my mentor, Doug Kerr, uh, worked to develop, and uh, a lot of our animal studies used Q Therapeutics. And Advanced uh, Cell Technology may be the first company to make a clinically viable stem cell for uh, a nerve disease in the eye. So this is what um, neural stem cells look like in a dish. This huge ball of cells is actually a very healthy form formation of neural stem cells. And they, they grow in these um, balls, these neurospheres, and they multiply and divide and they feed in, uh, in this medium. And then um, you can take them at various stages of life and differentiate them or push them into forming mature neurons. So they, these are the cells that we're using to inject into our mouse models and ultimately uh, what uh, we're hoping to translate into a human trial. But futuristically, um, we don't want to have to use neural stem cells from a foreign tissue, from a foreign uh, source. We want to be able to use your stem cells so we don't have to immunosuppress you. And the way we can do that is through a new technology called iPS cells, induced pluripotent stem cells. The idea for this, uh, uh, for this 
um, came from Japan and the um, scientist who developed this won a Nobel Prize last year. And what he found, what he could do is take your skin cells, take the cells from right underneath your skin, take them back into the lab and turn them back in time into embryonic stem cells. So this is your own cells being turned into stem cells. And then you can move them forward in time and turn them into whatever tissue type you want. So we've been working with a company in California called Iperion to use uh, a biopsy. I don't know if there are any of my patients who have been biopsied, but we've taken your skin cells, sent them to California, and then they ship your stem cells back to us. In this case, we're using them to study in a dish, but ultimately what we'd like to do is put them back into you. Uh, in the dish, these, um, these stem cells were turned into an astrocyte. So this is what astrocytes look like under a microscope. And just to show you a pretty picture, they turn into basically any cell type you want, and it's person-specific. So these, are, these would be from you. What we'd like to do is eventually um, inject these stem cells into the lesion um, in your spinal cord that's damaged. This is an anatomical representation here of your spinal cord. There are white matter tracts here shown in white. This is where the nerve bundles are that go up and down into your brain uh, and back. And then there are these um, butterfly looking areas that are called gray matter. These are where the nerves sit. And the nerves, for example, that move your arm would be sitting here and they send their projections out to the arm here. And in transverse myelitis, you may have a lesion in any part of the spinal cord. It could be in the white matter part in which case you'd lose your um, insulating sheaths. It may be in the gray matter part, in which case um, your neurons may die off. And so it depends on where your damage is, um, which type of stem cell you might need. So I'm gonna show you some um, neat pictures from a neural stem product called 566RSC. This is already in a trial. So this is an FDA approved neural stem cell line. It's being used for ALS. And these cells form neurons. Okay, so they don't form the insulating sheaths that people with demyelinating lesions would have, but it does form neurons. So if you have a gray matter lesion and you need neurons, this might help. We injected them into a mouse that has no myelin. And what, what we saw is uh, these red stem cells could migrate far and wide. So we would inject this into the back of a mouse brain and it would get all the way down the spinal cord and it would get all the way uh, up to the front of the optic nerve. So they could migrate far and wide. This is another product that Neurostem has called MHB1002. And these cells form myelin and they're very good at forming myelin. Just a few weeks after we inject them into a mouse, uh, this area here um, in yellow is myelin product and it's carried out by just a few cells. The cell actually is right there in the middle, and then it sends its projections out like this. And this is in a mouse model. Again, it has no myelin. And so what these cells automatically sense is that it needs myelin. And so they start producing myelin, and they send their projections out and start wrapping the axons. And this is an example of a whole track that's being remyelinated. Here's a kind of close up of what that would look like. When we translate this into a human trial, the way this is going to work is we'll use a device that looks like this that attaches to your spinal column, screws into the bone, and that moves up and down when you breathe because you can't inject while someone's... If you inject while someone's breathing and you don't adjust for that, then the needle's going to kind of go up and down the spinal cord. You don't want to do that. So you fix it to the spinal column and then the needle doesn't move within the spinal cord. And this has been tested in, uh, in an Atlanta hospital and is uh, very safe. So this is what we would use. And this is an example of what happens when you do this in a rat. You, you'll notice the butterfly image here. This is the gray matter. And these uh, black areas here on close up are stem cells that we injected. We injected from this point up here and the needle track came down and we injected in several spots. And this is where most of the stem cells ended up two weeks later, which is no surprise, but we did find stem cells migrating up and down by up to five centimeters. So they do migrate uh, and they do, um, they do form some of the cell types that we like. The next step is gonna be to figure out if these rats regain function. 
Um, Dr. Kaplan mentioned a model called EAE, which is useful for TM. This is an animal model in which the immune system attacks the spinal cord. And so that's, that's resembling uh, the human model of TM. And they leave these lesions in the rat spinal cord. And we don't know exactly where those lesions are when we inject. So if we inject in one spot and then they migrate to the lesion, that would be very encouraging because we're hopeful that uh, this could be applicable to a human. This is a picture of a very, very close up picture of a, of a rat's uh, optic nerve right here. Here's the snout, here's the other eye to give you some orientation. And we can inject uh, all the way down to the optic nerve very carefully and inject the stem cells here. Um, this is just another model for anyone out there with optic neuritis. Neural stem is also interested in regeneration of the optic nerve. So this is what a human trial will look like. Um, we've been talking about a human trial for a long time. We actually have the FDA application written up for most of it, and we encountered one major problem, which is um, the, when we had a meeting with the FDA, they asked us, well, how do you know that these TM patients are immunologically normal? What if you put in the stem cells and then it causes another TM? How do you know that they're not, not more likely to have a second TM event? And so what we did to address that is we took those stem cells and we tested patients to see if they make antibodies against those stem cells, if they already have those antibodies in their blood. Turns out one in seven did, and that's much higher than the general population. So for whatever reason, TM patients are more likely to reject stem cells. And so I think what we're going to do is just exclude patients who have that type of immune response. And so that would be one out of seven initially. And then as we figure out more and more about why that immune system uh, response exists, we can try to tailor the trial for, um, for patients who have those, that immune response. We're hoping the trial will take place in Bethesda at the NIH Clinical Center. This is a hospital, government hospital, that's only for research. And it turns out it's about uh, a fourth of the cost of doing the surgery at Johns Hopkins. I mean, it, it's obviously it's government subsidized, um, but it would involve our um, colleagues over there and it would be an easy way to reduce the cost. We would be working with NeuralSTEM and our colleagues at the NIH. We're hoping to recruit six patients. The first three will be completely paralyzed, no function, no motor function, no bowel bladder function, no sensory function, so completely paralyzed as well. And what we want to show the FDA with those first three patients is that there's no harm. Um, again, that's not an uh, obvious thing. The FDA really wants to see that those cells do not turn into tumors, that it doesn't make the TM worse, it doesn't cause another TM. So that's very important. And then after the after six months after, after that last patient is enrolled, then we'll take people with what's called an Asia C disability, which is where you still have some function. Because what we want to do there is we want to see if there's any room for improvement. Can we make these people actually functionally better by uh, injecting the stem cells? The hard part with patients as opposed to animals is you can't just sacrifice them after six weeks to see what the stem cells did. In the ALS trial, they do wait for the patients to die, and they almost always do. So that's an advantage in ALS. TM patients don't die early, so we do have to depend on your clinical outcome. Again, this will all be direct surgical transplantation. But we are hoping that, um, well, let me just mention the time window. For those of you who've already had TM, um, we're trying to time the stem cell injection to when, there's, when all the inflammation is gone, so that the inflammation doesn't exacerbate the rejection. And, but we want to do it before there's any uh, scarring in the um, spinal cord. And so what we think is that the, alt uh, the optimal um, trial period would be somewhere between six months and two years. For people outside that two-year window, don't fret. This is just a six-person trial, just to see if we can get a signal. And if there is a signal, then we can uh, expand the time window, um, try to find the, the best uh, time window, and then to also try to find the extremes. For those who don't like the idea of a direct surgical injection into the spinal cord, another thing that we patented here at Hopkins is a intravascular approach. So this is where you get a catheter inserted into a blood vessel, still awake for this procedure, and the cells are released into the bloodstream, and the cells are genetically engineered to bind to the part of the, in this case, the brain of the rat that's inflamed. 
So we're hoping to use this type of technology to direct stem cells from an injection into the blood into the area that's inflamed. Um, again, it, in this situation, what we'd like to do is um, inject the cells after the inflammation is mostly gone, but before there's any scarring so that those signals are still there for the stem cells to be attracted to. Not sure how well you, this projects in the dark, but there are stem cells on this side where there's inflammation and there's no stem cells on this side. So um, our, our colleagues at the um, company called NeuralSTEM have been wonderful. You can Google them. And at, at Hopkins, uh, my previous mentor, Doug Kerr, is at Biogen and all the folks in the lab who've helped make this possible. Take any questions? Now? How soon are those clinical trials recruiting? No, not, not recruiting now. Um, it has to be uh, approved by the FDA. We decided to go forward with the RSC line, that 556 five, line that forms mostly neurons, because it's already passed a lot of the hurdles uh, in the FDA. Um, those cells will form neurons and neuronal bridging. So even if you have a partly demyelinating disease, it could still help by getting around the lesion. Um, so we're, we're still hoping that that, that product uh, would be useful in TM, and it'll probably be the first study to go forward maybe in the next year. I always try to give a, a pretty broad uh, time window for when we're going to move things forward. A lot of it just depends on the FDA. <laughs> Maureen will be sending emails when we're recruiting, absolutely. Hi. Um, sorry if I bumbled through this a little bit. Quite a few years ago when they were first talking about stem cells and everything, they were saying we couldn't use ones from our own body because we have TM. So if we use stem cells from our own body, then they would turn into giving us TM still. Is that no longer the case, I take it? It depends on which cells, which stem cells we're talking about. Um, in, in the case of NMO, we also had this discussion with the FDA because what they're concerned about is if you take an NMO cell, um, a supportive cell like an astrocyte, and you implant that into the spinal cord, it has the target protein of your immune system. and It may in, totally enrage your immune system. So it may be the wrong cell type. So an NMO patient, maybe we don't want to use their own cells. Uh, but in TM, it may be just fine. So it depends on the disease. It depends on the stem cell type. And it depends on what we can do to the stem cell once we get it into the lab. What would be an alternative for NMO patients? An alternative for stem cell regeneration? There are uh, lots of different um, compounds that are being tested for regeneration that are not stem cells. Um, we're, we, all, we partner with several companies, one's here called Accorda, to test their remyelinating compound to see if it can either stimulate the stem cells that are already in your spinal cord or work through a different mechanism to try to improve function. Um, a few years ago, we used to go from company to company and try to convince them to open their medicine cabinets and look for drugs like this, and now they're coming to us. Um, I think this is a huge area of unmet need that a lot of companies are interested in now. So we're testing different compounds in the lab, and some of them are very promising. Have you factored in uh, whether insurance companies will cover this type of, of treatment? Uh, insurance companies cover this kind of treatment down the road. Have you spoken with them at all? Um, a little bit. Uh, so the trials obviously would be covered, but um, no, no stem cell treatment has ever been approved for anything neurologic. Um, so we don't know, but presumably if it treats the underlying disease and improves your overall neurologic function, keeps you out of the hospital, it'd be something that, that they, that would be in their financial best interest. Could take some time to uh, make them aware of that. Yeah. Well, I was kind of surprised, you know, a lot of these com uh, insurance companies are involved from the very beginning in, um, in trial preparations. So they're, they're sort of in the, in the in the project group. Yeah. 
Thank you, Dr. Levy. Thanks.